Uh, thank you, Senator, uh, for coming to speak to us. You've spoken about creating this new uh, Republican Party, and my question is, with so many office holders uh, throughout the country, Republicans, including here in Orange County, they seem so invested in big government. They vote for surveillance. They vote for uh, interventionism. They support all these kinds of policies that you know, don't really fly with us uh, libertarian-leaning Republicans. How do we fight against that at the grassroots level and the national level to actually affect those kind of changes in the party and ultimately in public policy? You know, I think within the party there are different um, caucuses and groups. I met somebody here from Campaign for Liberty, which was a group my dad started. Uh, Republican Liberty Caucus is a more libertarian-leaning group. So I would look for groups within the party. And I also think that uh, we need to have more uh, youth-oriented young young people after work, kind of going uh, to a, you know to meet at, at different locations. Uh, so I think there are a lot of ways you can. Also, I think getting involved in primaries. You know, 20% of people vote in a primary, very small number, and probably one in a thousand people volunteer and help in a primary. So if it's a state rep seat and you like one candidate more than the other, and you go knock on 200 doors for somebody, you've had a disproportionate effect. If you've got money, give them money. But if you don't have money and you, and you will work for people, that work is uh, very, very valuable to different candidates. The other thing I would do is, you know, I pretty much say I will support, you know, Republican nominee or whoever, uh, you know, but I will probably spend more work and time on the people who I really like, you know, that I really think are representing the ideas of liberty and the direction I want the party to take. So it doesn't mean you have to oppose everybody in your party, and I try to get along with everybody, but I will spend my time, my energy, and my money going and working for people who I think will change the system. The system is so broken that I would tell you in Washington the loudest voices for raising spending are Republican. Now, they want it for the military, but in order to get it, they have to give the Democrats domestic spending. So we raise military and domestic. In 2013, there was something called the sequester in 2011. Sequester was a slowdown in the rate of growth of spending, but it was still growing. But the right complained and complained and complained that we weren't getting enough military money, and so they said, we'll make any deal. So Paul Ryan made a deal with Patty Murray, and we raised the spending in 2013, 100 billion. We did it again in 2015. Both sides getting together to raise spending. And you may say, well, we've got to have spending for national defense. I agree. I think national defense is the number one thing we should do in Washington. Members of my family are in the military. I want them protected. I want them to have the best equipment. But we spend $600 billion on the military. How much is enough? We spend more than Russia plus China plus the next 10 countries. How much is enough? In the military, do you know that the green theology has infected the military? Everywhere you go, they're like, oh, look at these solar panels we have, or oh, we just built a $43 million natural gas gas station in Afghanistan. We spent $113 billion on infrastructure in Afghanistan. So we've got to rethink kind of what we're doing. And I think there is a, a new way, but I think particularly in California, because y'all are beaten up and bruised and abused and I'm trying to remember, y'all don't win, haven't won very often. I mean, for president, I don't know, it might have been Nixon the last time y'all went for, no, it was Reagan, I guess. But it's been a long time. So the Republican Party needs to reinvent itself here. And this isn't a criticism of Republican leaders. I've met many of them, many of them are good people. But you gotta reinvent and somehow begin attracting young people. And that's why my hope was, when I started the campaign, that we'd invigorate and bring young people in as, as libertarian Republicans. And that means we may not all agree on every issue, I think primarily the economic issues bring us together and some of the other issues divide us, but maybe the economic issues of low taxes, balanced budgets, and less regulation, that capitalism is a great economic system, that we want to leave more money in the private sector, we could agree on that. Maybe we're not going to agree on every other issue after that, but try to bring people in through that message. I still think that's possible. All Next right. question to your left, Senator. Thank you, Senator. My name is Tony Mazeka from Mission Viejo. Thanks for visiting friendly Orange County. Well, first of all, uh, there is a lot of debate going on right now with regards to NATO. And I totally agree with the need for us expanding our trade throughout the world globally. But what I am concerned about is without alliances that we have created, we will lose out and become very vulnerable to the things that we talked about before in terms of potential war, especially when we have people like Putin breathing down our necks. Right. No, I think, I think alliances are important. 
but it can kind of cut both ways sometimes uh, in the sense that we have to decide, you know, when we've gone so far in an alliance that we actually provoke a reaction from the other side. So, for example, many people wanted to put Georgia, the nation of Georgia, into NATO. Well, for those of you who know geography, Georgia, like, sits right on the edge of Russia and was part of Russia. So it sits right over there. If you put them in NATO, is that good that we now can protect Georgia, or is it so much that we've now provoked them into an altercation over a country that is pretty foreign to us and pretty distant from us? Same question with Ukraine. Should they go into NATO? But then it's a different question of whether or not the NATO nucleus that we had from after uh, World War II on, whether that can be a bulwark against Russian expansionism, and I think was, you know, after the war. So, no, I think alliances are important. I think that, uh, that we don't have to say to ourselves that we have to be completely quiet about telling them they need to spend more. I think they do. They don't spend enough, and it's not just Trump saying that. A lot of people have been saying NATO allies need to spend more on their defense. Um, so, but I don't think it's a, to me, it's not a carte blanche thing that we shouldn't have alliances. But I do worry about spreading the alliances to all the old Soviet satellites in the sense that it may drag us into something over there. I think Putin, while he's become more popular, um, we still completely dominate them militarily as far as on a global scheme of superpowers. And I think that part of his uh, sort of pugnacious invading surrounding Crimea, as well as Ukraine, is to detract or distract from his poor economy at home. You know, I mean, there's always the chance. I think he's always day to day whether or not he could have an upheaval because people are unhappy, you know, with not enough to eat. Anybody else? Uh, back, this is Joe Blanding from Fullerton. Hello, Senator. Uh, passionate supporter, both you and, and your dad. And, uh, you know, we have to, ha we're going to have an election here on June 7th. And I really, really wish you were still in it, but unfortunately you're not. And where I'm torn is it, it seems like Ted Cruz overall is better on you know taxes and economic issues and, and the Fed and but listening to Donald Trump's speech last week he kind of is appears to be better on, on on foreign policy in general and that's just kind of where uh, you know as a longtime supporter campaign for liberty everything um, where I'm torn sorry no help here <laughs> You know, I've, I've just decided to stay out of uh, the endorsement part. Part of it is, is that I think if I endorse a candidate, you know, from the two remaining or th possibly three remaining, that I sort of become de facto their surrogate and have to explain everything they're for. And uh, you're right. I haven't, Cruz is probably very good on economic issues and probably would be one of the most conservative slash libertarian slash free market people we've had. I think he would be good on economic issues. I'm concerned about making the sand glow in the Middle East being a strategy for foreign policy. Um, Trump has said some things that sound, you know, he recognizes the Iraq war was a mistake. So I, I think some of the things Trump has said is good, but Trump, I think, is an uh, unmoored from philosophy or anything. And so I have no idea whether what he's telling us one minute is really what he believes the next minute, you know. And I don't think there's a limited government tradition or bone in his body. So I just, he might be a conservative, but he might, I mean, he spent 66 of his 69 years being a progressive Democrat. So, you know, I don't know. But occasionally I'll hear his foreign policy pronouncements say, well, yeah, I think some of what he's saying is good, that we do need to be more circumspect of our interventions overseas. Um, but he's also talked about ramping up uh, by sending more soldiers in with ISIS as well. Um, I think there is a way to defeat ISIS, but part of it gets back to the idea of realism in the sense that Soviets have had a military base in Syria for 50 years. If we start with a strategy, oh, we're going to kick Soviet Union out of Syria and out of the Middle East, um, I don't think we're getting anywhere. But if we start with a strategy that Putin is an aggressor, he is kind of a bully, he will do things that are not, that we don't like, but at the same time he's in a region sometimes with the same self-interest, that we might be able to find points of self-interest where we use uh, that to try to find a solution. ISIS is done for if, if Syria could be stable. They're completely surrounded. There's 190,000 troops in Baghdad. There's 190,000 troops in the Peshmerga. The Turks have 600,000. The Jordanians have a couple hundred thousand. The, the uh, Israelis have over a million. 
They're completely surrounded by this chaotic situation where they can go back into havens is a problem. So you have to figure out some kind of settlement in Syria. And I don't see that answer coming from anybody, and that's another reason why I kind of want to keep my voice distinctive, but keep calling for, you know, some sort of rational process to getting to, uh, to peace and, get, and eradicating ISIS. Next question. Thank you, Senator. My name is Andy Whalen. I'm from Long Beach. I'm the Republican candidate trying to unseat Alan Lowenthal. And the question I have is, Puerto Rico is heading towards bankruptcy. Do you see this as an opportunity to take your idea of economic freedom zones and put it on steroids and create a sort of Hong Kong in the Caribbean? Well, you know, if they, if, uh, bankruptcy is not always a terrible thing. I mean, if you go through bankruptcy and you um, change and alter everything. So if I'm a venture capitalist and you have a company out here in Los Angeles that's millions of dollars in debt, we can wipe the debt out and I come in and unfortunately I have to lay off half of the workforce to make it profitable. If I have uh, union contracts, I might have to renegotiate them. If, if you get new management with new ideas and you dramatically change things, sometimes it's good. The other problem though is you also have the rule of law with, with Puerto Rico. People bought their debt given the rules and the rules are written into the Constitution. I think, frankly, and I'm not sure Congress really needs to do this, because if they quit paying on their debt, don't you think the creditors go to court and something figures out and they'll figure out a way of doing it? But your idea of making Hong Kong, I mean, making Puerto Rico Hong Kong is a great idea. If we could figure out how to do that, and that means opening borders for trade. Some of the people have also argued that they made their minimum wage too high, which you need to hear about in California, because it's, it's having a big heart and a small brain problem. Our next question is from Charlotte Samhills from Anaheim. Samhills. Hi, thank you so much for being here. I have a really quick question. So I know that you're opposed to the bulk collection of metadata, and you mentioned that a lot of people are now encrypting. Uh, what can Americans do to oppose the bulk collection of metadata other than encryption? Well, I think encryption has occurred, and it's a genie out of the box, and people are going to continue to use encryption. If we ban it in our country, also the business will just go to Asia or somewhere else, and they'll use other applications they can use overseas. Um, as far as, it, you know, opposing politically, I think it's a political question of who represents you. Um, and it's not like one of these things where I lay awake at night thinking that the government's rummaging through all my records. I really do think most of them are good people. It's kind of like the question, I play golf with an FBI agent. Do I think the FBI is evil or bad? No, I think they're mostly good. Probably like the rest of you, probably 98% of you are good, and I'm not sure which the 2% are, but <laughs> there's a few of you out there that aren't good. But same way with government or FBI or anything, it's that, uh, but you have to have a watchdog and you separate the powers, you separate the police power and the judicial power because it's a check and balance. And what you're trying to separate is, so the policeman who is a bigot, who would use his own personal force to go after people he doesn't like is checked and balanced by a judiciary. And it's the same way with the bulk collection. We've got to have checks and balances of it. And our founding fathers were very, very adamant on this. In fact, we didn't fight the revolution for the Second Amendment. Nobody ever thought they'd take our guns back then. They weren't in California, apparently. But, <laughs> um, but the Fourth Amendment is really what they fought it over. They were concerned about the British soldiers coming in their house to enforce the Stamp Act without warrants. And they're also concerned about generalized warrants. This was a big, it's hard, to, it's hard for us to fathom how big ideas and issues were back in those days. But the idea of a generalized warrant was an anathema and it was a big deal. And John Adams at one point says that when James Otis was opposing the generalized warrants or the writs of assistance, that that was the spark that led to the revolution. It's also a big deal over overseas as well. In England, there were famous cases being fought over generalized warrants. But I think the way you fight is politically. Um, you know, if you have sensitive communications, either personal or business, there are all kinds of applications you can put it on. Um, part of the idea we have to overcome, though, is there are certain people that believe if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. My response to those people is that's a far cry lower than innocent until proven guilty. So, um, but uh, I think everybody needs privacy. Even uh, religious people are gonna eventually need privacy because there's going to come a day that the politically correct decide to come to you in your house or in your church and say you can't believe certain things either. And that day is not too far off. 
Senator, I know you have a very packed schedule. Um, we will take one more question. I want to remind everyone that he is going to be available in the front lobby to sign books. Um, they are available down in the museum store and on the exit. Our last question. Hi there, Senator. Um, thank you so much for coming to the Nixon Library. We really appreciate it. Uh, my question is, uh, I notice a lot of people in my generation, um, as they grow older, they kind of come to their political consciousness um, around college, and I feel like for the last 10, 15 years, as you've noted, they see the Republican brand as very damaged. And I think the result of that is a lot of folks in my generation now voting or campaigning for an open socialist for the presidency, which is absolutely incredible in a historical context. Um, so my question is, how do you take voters who are passionate about um, uh, somebody running for office as a socialist and convert them to the Republican brand, especially presidential elections um, down the line and into the future? You know, I think it's tough, but I think a lot of young people are not fixed yet in their ways. As you said, your ideas and your opinions change over time. Um, you know, there was the saying, I forget who said it, that if you're not a liberal before 30, you don't have a heart. If you're not a conservative after 30, you don't have a brain. <laughs> but uh, I do think that if we're trying to approach young people, so I went and talked at Berkeley. I didn't talk about balanced budgets. I didn't talk about regulations or taxes. I talked about personal freedom, privacy, and the government not collecting your information without an individualized warrant, and I was received pretty well. So I think you have to know your audience. Young people don't have any money. They've got some of their parents, maybe, but they don't have any money. And so they don't really care about regulations, taxes, things over regulation, overzealous regulators. They don't care about that. But they do care about personal uh, issues, personal liberty. And I think that's the one thing that we need to inform people who think socialism is no big deal. And many of them think socialism is no big deal because Bernie's for democratic socialism. So the first thing we need to inform them is, is that majority rule is not a good thing, and we are not a democracy, we're a constitutional republic, and... <laughs> but even more so, we need to inform them that socialism is the opposite of choice. So if they tell you that they're young and they believe in freedom and they believe in choice, well, socialism is the opposite cho of choice. It's anti-choice. It's taking away your choice from what you want to buy, what you want to sell, who you want to interact in. It's the opposite of freedom. And most of the time when we've tried socialism in a whole scale way, it's led to violence and death and camps. Stalin killed 63 million people. And they said, oh, that was just Stalin. That doesn't happen. But really in socialism, there's an inherent uh, use of force that comes, or implied force that comes with everything. Because to prevent you from selling things you want to sell, they give you a ticket. If you don't pay the ticket, you continue to sell something, they put you in jail. And then ultimately, uh, you know, in, in many cultures, it's been, been death. It comes from those who want to be free to choose. Uh, I think Milton Friedman was good at presenting this to, and it was a little more of a libertarian message, but good at presenting this to young people as well. Uh, my dad was great at it. I always told him he wasn't cool. His ideas were kind of cool, but he wasn't that cool. But young people loved him. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Senator, thank you.